And today we have two political pros who will be able to take a look at the changing state of campaigning and we hope get out their crystal balls and preview the political landscape for 2018 and maybe a little bit beyond. Kathy Allen is a Seattle-based political consultant. She's the national vice president of the National Women's Political Caucus and president of the Connections Group. She has helped elect thousands of women around the world. This past fall, she helped recruit, train, and support women running for mayor throughout the state. And after the elections, the number of women mayors rose from 11 to 38. <laughs> Last year, she worked for Mitzi Johannicht, a 32-year veteran deputy sheriff uh, in King County who challenged the popular sheriff, who was also her boss. Through an online campaign strategy, she helped Johannic win with 58% of the vote. So, please welcome Kathy. Randy Peppel is a strategic communications professional with three decades of experience in public affairs, consulting, uh, policy advocacy, media relations, and political campaigns. Uh, he's the executive director of the Reform Alliance, which is a nonprofit policy advocacy group he co-founded with former Washington Attorney General Rob McKenna. He managed Rob McKenna's 2012 campaign and previously served as his chief of staff. He's also served as the CEO of the Northwest offices of the multinational communications consultancy Hill and Knowlton and was chief of staff to U.S. Representative Rick White. He's advised candidates, political committees, and party organizations in Washington, Oregon, along with public agencies and Fortune 50 companies. So please welcome Randy Peppel. So I'm going to ask our guest first to take a few minutes to speak from some personal experience about how campaigns and campaigning have changed in the course of their careers. And then after we do that, we're going to have a conversation about a number of issues that come up and we'll, as always, leave time for questions. So let's, uh, let's begin with Randy. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. I'm going, to, I'm going to stand for this part of the program because we sat on the drive all the way up here. So uh, try to, but thank you very much for the invitation, the kind, uh, kind words, Dean. And, and thanks to Kathy for suggesting the, the easiest foil she could get uh, to, to come up here. I didn't know about the multi-thousands in speaking fees I could have obtained. Uh, evidently, I'm a cheap day. Uh, but, but thank you. And, and I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about kind of the historical changes in elections and what I've seen. And then Kathy's going to provide you a, a much more recent example of how this works on the ground. And uh, as Dean says, I've, I've been doing this for three decades. And, and I'd been scanning the crowd for someone that I, I could recognize from the, the campaigns that I've done up here. And, and I'm afraid that I'm not sure that I, I do. I, uh, the first campaign where I was up in this area was Rod Chandler's US Senate race. And so in 1991, I spent a lot of time organizing uh, the Orm family and others uh, with their help to, to organize up here in Whatcom County for that, for that race. But um, you know, it, I'm gonna take this in 10 year chunks uh, just to, to provide ease of doing this without notes. But when I managed my first campaign in 1988, when Rod Chandler was running for re-election in the 8th Congressional District, um, our technology consisted of a brother uh, programmable typewriter, <laughs> which you could enter a whole letter into. <laughs> and so you could personalize the name and then push a button and the rest of the letter would come out. That was our technology. We were still using three by five cards for our voter file. And you know, looking around this room, I'm sure that there are a lot of you who volunteered on campaigns, run in campaigns, helped help manage campaigns even. 
And you can probably remember those days when you still had the three by five cards. You were filling out, okay, they did this, they did this. We're dating it, putting it down. That was 1988. And at that time, campaigns were a lot less expensive. Here I was running a re-election campaign for a member of the Ways and Means Committee, someone who would go on to run statewide uh, for the U.S. Senate. And, you know, we raised the amazing sum of $400,000. And that was huge. That was enough to buy television for, for, you know, for, for people that were going to elect him with 70% of the vote anyway. It was, it was a wonderful time. Flash forward then 10 years later, in 1998, I was chief of staff for Rick White, who was a congressman from the first congressional district. Uh, it, doesn't, it didn't come up this far. It came to the suburbs of South Everett, uh, is as far north as the first came. And Rick was the founder of the Internet Caucus in, uh, in, in the U.S. Congress. And in 1994, he got elected. In 95, we said, you know, gosh, we represent Microsoft. Microsoft's in our district. We need, to, we need to be on the cutting edge of technology. So we founded the Internet Caucus. We said, okay, what's going to be the requirement for people, for members of Congress, to be part of the Internet Caucus? And we decided, we looked around and said, here's something that we really don't have here. They have to have a website. Two members of Congress had a website at that time. This is 1995. So we said, okay, we're going to do that. So by 98, when I uh, was chief of staff for, for Rick, and he was running for re-election, and uh, uh, had the misfortune of running against uh, Mr. Inslee, and, uh, uh, you know, we were now using, oh, my time is already up. <laughs> See, and I turned off mine, and I turned off Kathy's when she gave me mine. Um, but, uh, you know, we ha were technology advanced. Our databases were, were, were on computers even. You know, so we had a little bit of technology going on. But we still, we were, our, our, our campaign wasn't connected in any way to the Internet. Uh, our campaign was, you know, email was not something we were using on a campaign basis to communicate. All we had was the databases that we could print out, that we could organize our voters very well. We were still then printing them out into hard copies and highlighting them. And rent. I mean, that was 10 years after the three by five cards. That's how far we'd advanced. We mainly used uh, technology for our financial reporting to the federal government. We, we had that on computers because we wanted to get that right. And, uh, you know, then flash forward to 2008. By 2008, digital campaigning was the cutting edge. And the candidate who took advantage of it was Barack Obama. And it was really the first campaign that used technology to target voters in a, in a very substantial way. And he was building on the 2004 campaign of Howard Dean, who'd organized the internet for fundraising, primarily, and was using what was called meetups, which nobody had ever heard of, to get his campaign off the ground. And so Obama took that to a whole nother level. In 2004, Republicans had the advantage in technology and in voter targeting. It's why George W. Bush was easily reelected re to a second term after having, in some people's mind, not really won a first term. <laughs> but in 2008, the Obama campaign blew by that practice. And you know, I, I have a memo, and I brought it up with me just to, as a reminder. In 2009, I got an email from my uh, TV consultant who sent me an email about using digital campaigns. You know, how are you going to use social media and digital communications in campaigns? It's cutting edge and so on. This is 2009. Now in 2018, and Kathy will uh, talk, uh, talk this, if you don't have a digital strategy on the day you announce, you're a loser. You're not going to win. You will not communicate to your, uh, to, to your constituents, the prospective voters, in a cost-effective manner. And it's going to be very hard to be successful, unless you're running a legacy re-election campaign for an incumbent and they get re-elected <laughs> anyway. But you know, that's where we're at now. Now, in 2012, my most uh, recent campaign where I managed campaign, I managed campaign, as was said, for Rob McKenna, running for governor. We spent over a million dollars on digital communication. First campaign to ever spend that kind of money, to vote that kind of money in this state to a statewide race. 
And as I look back at, at, at that experience and, and try to learn lessons as to uh, why we lost to a clearly inferior person, um, <laughs> one, of the, one of the main takeaways I have is that I would have tripled that funding that I put into digital and taken away from TV, even though we were spending massively uh, on, on, a, on a magnitude uh, that far exceeded any other campaigns in this state, use of digital communications. That's how far it had grown just from 2008 when President Obama and his campaign staff took it to a whole new level. By 2012, we were spending a million on a statewide race on ours. We, we announced on the web. We, we, we were doing uh, uh, podcasts with Rob on a weekly basis and sending it out. We were doing stuff, multi-language uh, activities, all web-based to communicate with our voters. We were dropping the cost of communications down. And frankly, that is what has so much changed uh, the political uh, campaigns today from previous campaigns is how much, how much less it costs you to communicate to voters. Because with a push of a button, you can push out emails. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. The Republican National Committee sent out an email in, that I received talking about the fact that they sent out 1.6 billion, with a capital B, emails in the 2016 election year. They only sent out 975 million last year. But the, more of those were open. They got more emails open because they're targeting and approved that much in one year. Their ability to put that email into the inbox of somebody who would actually respond to it. And again, you think about it, 975, almost a billion emails. You only have to, you know, the, the law of, of, of uh, large numbers says you only need a small percentage of a billion people to open your email for it to be successful. And how did they do that? Facebook targeting. They were able to utilize the information, the data that they could obtain from Facebook, match it up to their email lists so they could know, is this person going to open the email or not open the email? And for those of you who are technologically savvy, it will come as no surprise that Facebook knows far more about you than you want them to. And their ability to tell you the left-handed Volvo drivers who were born before 1950, who have three grandkids and somebody in college that they care deeply about, and oh, by the way, their most important issue is the environment, Facebook knows. And that means campaigns with enough money can find that out as well. So I'll leave that to Kathy now to talk about that, uh, about how you utilize that money and that digital information to reach your voters. And I look forward to the conversation we'll follow and get into some more specifics. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you for all coming out today so that we would have far more progressives in the audience than his Republican friends <laughs> and all of that. What I want to say, when last I was here, do you remember that? Hillary was running and she was going to win by 15 percentage points, no problem. And the Democrats were going to not only lose the legislative elections that follow, but, you know, they didn't have enough of backbench, so we were worried about, you know, the Republicans here are going to end up taking over. What's that going to be like in terms of the Democratic Party? And then we took a look at some of the actual things that were happening around us and said, will there ever be a time when I can actually look at local government again as something that is worthy of us trying to build a back bench like it started? You went into local government, you learned something about what was going on, you understood process, and then you started moving up without coming in with your check of $1.2 million and saying, I want to run for this job. The important part that's happened now is that when that election was over, Hillary didn't win. I was done with politics. That was it. Had it, except for wonderful and loving clients that I had had before. All right, I'd help them. And then what happens is that I'm whining, feeling bad for myself, actually spending a lot of time thinking the end is at hand and 
can't watch TV, you know, watch TV and you just munch yourself into the entire evening of food. It's like awful. Just there it is, Rachel. How long can you watch Rachel without, you know, running for the refrigerator for more in all of it? So what happened is that I had I had said no to seven incredibly good campaigns. And then this woman comes in my office. And I already know I'm not going to take this race. Absolutely not going to take this race because it's a woman who is running against our very popular sheriff, who is an incumbent, who has very high popularity poll numbers, who is pretty much um, self-writes his own check, had spent $178,000 in his last campaign. And I had looked at that and said, and, and what do you got, Mitzi? What, what do you got going on? Mitzi at that point turned to me and said, nothing. I used to run the SWAT squad here in town, the first woman that has on the West Coast. I also, um, I believe I can do a better job. And I believe that everybody in this damn office believes that too, because so many people hate this incumbent. So this incumbent, unbeknownst to me, who seemed like a pretty nice guy every time I met him, was a definite, a bullier, an arrogant guy who was an abuser of women. The actual number of women that were in our police department dropped from 26% to 11% under his tenure, and he had a rape charge against him. Now, do you think anybody had ever reported said rape charge? No. Do you think anybody believed that that was a real charge? No, no, no. Do you think anyone would invest in someone who said there was such a guy? Oh, no. No, no. In all of it, my candidate is a woman with no name recognition. Worse. Her name, Mitzi Johanknik. Oh, now there's a popular name. Who calls a police chief Mitzi? And more important, Johanknik, you could never spell if you had to. So all of this notwithstanding, she has a few other things. She doesn't belong to any social fraternities, no local group. She's been in the cop shop for 32 years. And she's a lesbian, married to a lovely woman who has, you know, been kind of working as a, oh, positive, spirited chiropractor breaking people's bones. And so all of that has been, <laughs> been suspiciously different. But let me just say, she walks into my office and she had me at hello. This is the woman I got into the business to help. And despite all that, it's when we started realizing that this is going to be, first of all, the incumbent. The second was the money. The third, the name recognition for him and none for us. And the fourth, he's a cop. He's the top cop. This is not somebody you take on lightly or else you start seeing, you know, funny things happening to your, you know, car and wondering, is there any, is there anyone here that would ever investigate that? No, no. So what happened is that I had spent some time trying to figure out how we were going to be able to work a campaign like this. And now, as I look back on it, it was. It was, uh, it was impossible, and she doesn't win. Well, what happens is she does win. And how that happened was that one of the cheapest races I have ever run in my life. And what it really was the unbelievable part is everything I'm going to tell you about what we did is actually slitting my own throat, which, of course, I have done many times, so it's not a problem. <laughs> the part is, is that, you know, the money we used to make on campaigns like TV buys, as, as actually Randy was talking, and taking a look at all those brochures we did and taking a look at all that other stuff, what if that's not the most effective, cost-efficient way to reach voters? One thing that's still the same is the golden rule of all campaigns is still the same. You need one message the right message, preferably tested. Got to go to the right folks. Got to go to them, you know, at the right time, many times, in a variety of ways, in a price you can afford. All of those things were still in play, but everything had changed in regards to how we were going to actually define that golden rule for this campaign. What happened is that I had actually had talked to some of Randy's digital friends. Randy, Randy and I have done point counterpoint for a number of years. And frankly, what's happened is that I knew after I had talked to him before he started the campaign for Rob McKenna, that after I had listened to him and said, what's your, what's your tech campaign going to be? What's the digital campaign? And I came away afterwards going, good. He doesn't know anything either. This is good. This is perfect. They're like, nothing. He and I both are on the same wavelength. We're talking TV. We're talking the usual. And then he goes and 
becomes this digital guru and finds these young men um, who actually, young men who were Republican that had met on the campaign and, oh, by the way, were whiz kids. And I actually had thought if that campaign had had another three weeks of just digital campaigning, they would have won because they had a target we never, ever had in the Democratic Party, never. What happened then is that Randy, being the nice guy he is, wanting me to not hire any good Democrats, go hire the Republicans, I went ahead and met these fellas just to see what they were up to. And when my day of doom came and I'm looking at this woman that ought to be, shoulda, woulda, oughta been the sheriff, and I have no money to speak of, we had guessed we could raise $60,000 to $100,000 to a guy that already had 116 in the bank who is an incumbent whose name is actually understandable. So all of these things notwithstanding, we started right at the beginning. Okay, well we got $60,000 to start. We ultimately ended up having 100,000. We were able to actually manage to weasel out of a lot of different places. What we ended up doing is we literally started with who do we need to reach? Well, two other things were at play. Obviously the whole country was hearing the first name of Harvey Weinstein and all of the sexual abuse that had been very much under, under every rug you can find, the fact is, is that it became big news. Seattle, not as much as I see, and it breaks my heart up here in Bellingham, but Seattle still had one last hurrah left for news. The TV news was going to stay and be a major player in this campaign. They actually got it when we could actually produce the three people who had alleged rape or sexual assault against the sheriff. They actually covered it. Now, did they put the story in the paper right away? Did they put it on TV right away? Oh no, because of course the incumbent came in with lawyers in hand and said, you put that on TV, I will sue your butt and you aren't leaving town. So from that perspective, it was a little hard to get the stories out to begin with, but meanwhile, we had taken a TV camera two TV cameras, and we had talked to all of the women who had been assaulted or had been laid off or who lost their jobs because of him. And we started this actual just TV short little 30 second spots, not done with the professional teams I'm used to of $13,000 for production for basically the same thing only with a lot more bells and whistles. What we did is we just had these women in their own words tell us what their experience had been with this guy. And then we just took pictures of the court suits, the actual, what the judges had said, in addition to the newspaper stories we never really, no one really, really took as serious. And we, those ads would be the stories from the women, they would actually be sent to all these women in selective groups in King County. We went to five different areas, this five different cable uh, stations that we were able to use. But frankly, we just picked the actual four to four women under the age of 55. Because the women over 55 had already heard about it and were already adamant to be voting for Mitzi, whoever that woman is whose name we can't pronounce. That was part of it. We started with that. Second, we, uh, who, I did not know that one could actually just buy the names of emails. I did not realize how much that cost pennies. The, the time we have spent, all of us, trying to figure out, now where's that email? Who has that email? Where can we find these emails? Well, there are vendor services now, and they are far less expensive than voter files, which are the list of all the people who voted in the last election. So we went ahead and started doing very focused, just shot out to people a message a video, and then an email, a message, a video, and said if you want more information, we did another website. We did just the facts, ma'am. And that was a long website of all of the truths we could prove with the proof on that website. We managed to be able to do all the above for $60,000. Meantime, our opponent had turned around and had by that time put of his own money $478,000 into the campaign coffers, his campaign coffers. Now we had a few things going for us on this. It was the right time 
everyone was talking from Me Too to what was going on. Women, ang women angry that we still are fighting battles we shouldn't be fighting now. The president giving us morning entertainment, evening news about all of the things he's continuing to do that just absolutely get us furious. And then we were able to also keep the local press reporting it. We came out with the real people, with the real facts. It helps that I had, both Randy and I have been journalists. And so it helped that we knew what journalism was back in the day. And then we were able to also start focusing on very specific groups of people, sending them the video, in case you weren't watching cable all night. And we were also able to give them follow-up information they could go to themselves online. That was the beginning. The next was, after you came to the website, we asked if you, if you liked what you saw, if you actually wanted to help us to actually contribute. So we were able to raise that other $40,000 to continue keeping it on the air. It became sort of a self-sustaining machine as we got going on it. And I have to say that as we pulled it all together, the, the numbers kept going up. Not our numbers because we had no money for polls. This is the first time I've done a major campaign where there's no money for polls. The second, we had women coming out of the woodwork to come and help, and a lot of guys who actually supported the women that they were with, and they did too. And then the third part is, is that as things got closer to the end, the women organizations all came forward and held press conferences to be able to say, we believe her. We believe the women who have stood up and said, this guy is bad. This guy is bad. And the good news for, uh, for me was not only this guy had a lot of money, but here's the other thing. He became his own political consultant. He did his own spots. And I still to this day believe, what a blessing when you need it. The guy is <laughs> guy's doing an ad with all his friends standing around saying what a good guy he is. All men. Oops. <laughs> so what happens is that it ends up coming down. And I have to say, <laughs> You know, it's only three weeks before the end of the election when the ballots drop that I'm still sitting there thinking, how are we going to pull this baby off? I, I still have not sure I have this path here. We don't have as much as he's going to have, We're, and, and he's the incumbent, all the above, and just didn't let anybody know that. We walked around knowing we were doing right, knowing that we were part of the good force that was doing this because it was the right thing to do been a while because that would have to sustain me through very dry times, given the fact that campaigns I usually would make $60,000, dollars mm -hmm. uh, that would be maybe $140. And I gave most of the rest away because basically one of the, the things that hurts when you're trying to get in and look at the digital potential in front of you, which is better, more, creative, personalized conversations, you the candidate to folks, what ends up happening is that ends up taking more time and work, but it's not something that consultants or people in the business are going to end up getting paid for. The fact is we have to take major cuts in terms of the profits we make for this to actually work. And the guys that are smarter, of course, are the digital guys, but I can only go so far before you realize I don't know a damn thing about digital stuff. I know what to hire and I know what to do, but I'm not doing it. So from that perspective, I can say that it became the most exciting time to realize that I wasn't old, that I wasn't behind the time in such a way that I needed to curl up and go away. The fact is I began to see that we have to get aboard with this new technology. It's not a fad. It's going to be here for a while. And so from that, I can also say that not only is it working, it has given us a backbench in Washington State of some 160 women who are now in office that were not in office, not even thinking they were going to be in office. I might say that Bellingham isn't exactly keeping pace with that. You could pick up the speed here. <laughs> but the fact is, in my world, the fact is, is what we have seen is a major change in how people get individual messages that they respond to. That plus a whole lot of women being absolutely mad at not having achieved what they had deluded themselves into believing was equality, myself included. The fact is, is that we were able then to see that we need to get our act together, get back into the game, get back into actually doing something. and. 
use this technology that is going to actually save us money in so many ways and bring messages directly to folks. So with that, I don't think that you should throw out the computer. I don't think that you should get off of Facebook. I think that these technology swings that we see are very much electing people. And I'm living proof. Thanks. All right. Okay. Quite a change. Uh, you know, we've talked about how the electorate and politics has become so polarized in the country. Mm -hmm. Just, I'd like to hear your perspectives as political consultants. Are there any persuadable voters out there? Mm -hmm. Or do you just, is it, is it all about just turning out your base? Well, it, you know, the, the golden rule of politics that Kathy outlined is, is absolutely correct and hasn't changed. The technology, the underlying technology might change, but it's still, you got to get the people at the right time with the right message and, and get them out. Uh, but the, the uh, add to that is you got to make them vote. Now, in Washington State, you know, for the last decade, we uh, have been voting by mail. So, I mean, how hard is it to vote? The ballot comes to your house. <laughs> And the dirty little secret is you don't even need to put a stamp on it. The post office will deliver it to your county it's auditor true. anyway. It's true. It's true. <laughs> yep, they do. So don't put a stamp on it. It still gets it. They'll, they'll drop it out. And they charge the county, which is beautiful. Now remember that I Kim that. is coming next week. <laughs> right. but, uh, News you can you, use right but, here. But, right. Uh, yeah. you know, so we've made it as easy as possible to vote. But still, you've got to get those people to vote. Mm -hmm. And as we saw last year, in, in uh, 2017, record low turnout in Washington State. Mm -hmm. Even though you had a, an open mayor's race in the city of Seattle, driving turnout. Even though you had a state senate race where I live in, in East King County, Woodenville area, that was going to determine whether Republicans or Democrats controlled the state senate. I mean, you had some, some big issues. You didn't have any statewide initiatives for the first time, I think, in 15 years. Yeah. And so what happened? Turnout went like this. So the rule is, You've got to get your people, it, you, can, you can have all the technology in the world that tells you who your voters are, but if you don't get them to cast their ballot, it's irrelevant. So the second on, are there persuadables? Yes, there's seven of them, and, <laughs> and one of them's in this room and I'm looking for them. <laughs> no, it, it, there, it, very few persuadable voters. I mean, if you look at it, there was actually a Gallup poll that was just released. It was in the paper yesterday that said, for the first time ever in Washington state, more people self-identify as a liberal, not how they vote Republican or Democrat, but their political ideology, for the first time, liberal was above conservative. But the middle was still the plurality. The largest was those who, who said they were moderate. Yeah. You know, the liberal was 30, conservative was 29. 36 uh, were, were moderate, and 5% uh, said they were foraging for mushrooms at the time and couldn't be bothered. So, um, so they didn't have, have a party to be at. But, there, but once you start peeling away those moderates, you start asking them questions about how they vote, they're lying when they say they're moderate, or, or uh, that they're independent, excuse yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. You get Republicans, you get Democrats. There's always going to be more people who say they are Democrats than Republicans in this state. The number of those who say they're independent goes up or down by how embarrassed they are by their party that they really want to vote for. <laughs> when Democrats are doing stupid things, which, let's face it. Used to be, used to be a lot. <laughs> a lot of times. Then, the, then more, people, more of the Democrats go into the independent column. When Republicans are doing their stupid stuff, a couple of the Republicans move into that independent column. But you can peel them away with other questions and determine they're going to vote Republican, they're going to vote Democrat. The actual independence of people who will vote for the person and not the party will go under 10% in off years. In a presidential year, you might see it at 15%. But those are the only ones who you can change their mind. So you're looking at the fact that there's only 15% that might change their mind or that you can persuade with your great message. But that means you've got 40% of your voters that you know you've got them, you got to get them to turn out. It's much more expensive to convince somebody to change their mind or adopt your point of view than it is to drag somebody to the polls. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, many fewer persuadables and much cheaper to reach your people, so the money goes towards your base. And that's, you know, that's the Trump phenomenon. It, it, you know, everything he does is not to convince anybody that he's not an idiot. It's true. 
It's all to convince the base that he's still with them. It actually, I would even, I would even say that it's a get out the vote for us women, frankly. What's happened is that I disagree that there aren't things that could make you into persuadables. And uh, the, this race that we took a look at, actually many of the women who were running for mayor throughout the state, and this actually happens in terms of places where women weren't supposed to win, in terms of places like, uh, frankly, uh, Tacoma is a great example. Vancouver is a good example. These are cases where when you take a look at it, what really happened is these women decided to come home and vote their issues. And what you can do, you know, most of us believe in the, in the political consulting world that issues are like tissues. You use them <laughs> once, you throw them away. The fact is when it comes to really the issues here, if we are women, who are angry about what's going on, that anger has been pivotal in getting women to be persuaded to actually come back and not just vote for a woman because they're a woman, but vote for a woman because when a woman's running, she's usually the smartest one in the race and most people should be voting for her anyways. But <laughs> one out. what we know, in many of these cases this last year, women who ran ended up having a great time. And I predict that already we have the largest number of women that are actually registered to run this year than we've ever had before. We have 37.4% women right now in the state legislature. We have about 33% of our statewide officers are women. I gotta tell you right now, uh, we have 50% of our delegation that goes to Washington DC are women. The fact is what we're seeing is for the first time last year, more women voted for women than men voted for women. And this has been one of those things that comes back to back in the day, women literally were raised to compete mostly against each other. And what we have seen that is very frankly, we see that all the time in politics. We particularly see it in judicial races where it turns out that the men are, are just saying, well, look, she can't be any worse than the guy that's right there. I'm gonna vote for, for her. The fact is, is that women until last year, women last year ended up voting far greater for women than they ever have, at least here in Washington State, California, and Oregon. They all have. And so as part of it, there is a kind of a realization that if we don't take care of our own, that's a problem. The other part is the number of guys who ended up voting for women was huge too. All of that is that there are issues that are basic. If you're talking about police, if you're talking about education, if you're talking about just basic, how are we gonna be able to afford to live here? These are the issues that when you start working at the local level, these are the times and places you can persuade folks. For the first time last year, I can say as a woman who's worked 25 years to get women uh, actually in the queue, last year was the very first time that we ever have a backbench, that we now have women in every single city here in Washington state that literally are now actually at least on a bench or they're actually in a political office and have started taking a look at what's going on. I believe that persuasion is changing. The idea of persuasion is no longer going to be about um, negatives. It's not going to be how many negative, horrible things can I say about you. What's happening now is that the positives have changed. People don't want to hear all the things that you belong to. They don't want to hear all the things that you think you want to take accomplishment for. The fact is what people want to hear is that other people believe you, other people trust you, other people are going to speak on behalf of you. That's where persuasion's coming in is we have much more, I, I think we have a, a whole lot more folks who because of uh, online um, and social media kinds of things, people believe differently now. That if a friend tells me this person's terrific, I'm going to believe it as opposed to a negative hit piece that's paid for by somebody outside the state who's saying bad things about the person I want to vote for. It's not the same. Hmm. Not the same. You know, one of those polarizing issues in this country is guns. You think? And this is a, <laughs> what we've seen in the last couple of weeks also is a real example of how social media has had an impact. Um, some of the students at Marjorie Stoneman oh, Douglas High School have gone from like a few Twitter followers to over a million in two weeks. They're using social media to organize a march. They're using social media very adeptly. Mm -hmm. Is there a sense that this might be a year where things change on the gun issue? Uh, what do you think? Take that a, this is a trap. 
I can see, I can see it. <laughs> I see this one covered. Uh, I believe that yes, but it's more that the general public as a whole is tired of this debate. And I th tend to think that what's happening here is that guns has become this issue. And we have guns on our ballot this year, so to speak. We have lethal force in regards to police officers and so on. Do we want to be able to actually do more to train our cops to be using other things besides lethal force? In that regard, it's not, we were just talking about this on the way up, it's not like, should we get rid of all guns? Should we do extra background checks and so on? Those are the kind of things that draw people to the votes. Do I think things are gonna happen? It depends, because in my, in my situation, I look at it and say, this is like sexual assault. And that is, if it stays in the front page of the news, and Rachel's talking about it every night for three weeks, and keeps, keeps talking about it, and then the same, the Fox guys are talking just opposite this on TV. The fact is, is that I do think that what you have is critical mass to keep the subject moving, and that in itself is what drives people, I think, to turn out. I think that you will see uh, gun laws changed in a lot of places, but I think it'll all be on the margins. I, I mean, and, and what's frustrating to me as parent of young women, uh, as father of young women, is that we're not going to pass anything that would have stopped that tragedy from happening. And we're not likely to pass anything that would stop the Las Vegas tragedy from happening. And the, the fact is, you can go back to the Muckleteo tragedy from happening. The changes that will happen in gun laws, OK, bump stocks. Mm -hmm. I think you'll see those banned. You, those can be banned by an executive kids, order. You kids, know. kids but, not being able but to buy them. Getting to the, yeah, but I don't think you're going to see the age raised on buying mm -hmm. uh, long guns. I think you might see them that they're going to have to have a background check. But I, I'm not sure that you're going to see anything that would have impacted or stopped any. And so it's, what can we do to stop a madman or mad woman from going off mm -hmm. and taking with them precious lives? Mm -hmm. And that's where I think the gun debate right now is fed. Because on the left, you have to watch for overreach. Because there is a segment of the population that, that I say is on the left that uh, believes, hey, banning guns, certain types of guns, is the way to go. And if they do that, they will ensure that they will not win back control of the U.S. House of Representatives because they will not be able to compete in some of the races they need to win to win that majority. On the right, you've got folks who say, no regulations, no how. Mm -hmm. You know, if I want an Abrams tank in my yard, I want an Abrams tank in my yard. You know, and, and I don't think they're going to be uh, yeah. changed either. So, I, you know, I, I am pessimistic uh, about real change happening that would have an impact on these types of tragedies. Mm -hmm. And uh, it will be a turnout mechanism, but the people who will turn out are the ones that already have their mind made up on this subject mm -hmm. today mm -hmm. or had their mind made up last week. I mean, anytime you get into a gun debate, the left has to be concerned. If they raise the temperature too high, they will get defeated by the gun owners who look at this case and go, why do we need new regulations on guns when if we'd simply had people respond to the warnings that they were given 20 some times, you could have stopped it. Mm -hmm. Why do we have to punish law-abiding gun owners because the FBI didn't do their job? I mean, that's the debate that's taking place. And I don't think you're going to change anybody's mind. And so that's why I don't think it's going to be an issue that brings out voters that weren't otherwise going to vote this for. Well, I know we want to get to questions soon. Um, but yes. first, uh, I asked you to bring your crystal balls with you. I mean, I know you're all very much into data and you're not into just making predictions out of nowhere. But let's have a couple of predictions here. Um, Will the Democrats retake the House of Representatives? Um, I think the answer is no. Uh, I, and I, and, and, and uh, three months ago, I would have said the answer is yes. But the tax bill is going to turn out to be the saving grace for Republicans in some districts because right now it is working. Now, the fact that it raised our deficits to over a trillion dollars a year, yeah. but you know, nobody's paying that right now, but they are getting some yeah, money right. back. And they're seeing 
benefits from companies bringing uh, capital back from overseas. So I think the tax bill is actually going to be a positive impact. It's going to be closer. And the unfortunate reality, truth about that, is government is going to become even more unmanageable at the federal level. Because when you cut the ma Republican majority down to, from uh, its present uh, 24 uh, uh, majority down to somewhere in the single digits, yep. then any 10 members can stop something from occurring. Kathy, you agree? I uh, tend to think that we have a long way to go in the House. I do think we take the Senate. I do think that when it comes to the House, I believe that we do get within that single digit. I'm not sure we have, just in looking at all those states seriously, one thing I can tell you is that we do have a blue wave coming and she wears usually the right kind of clothes. Because the fact is, is that right now, because we have more women, more women running than we ever have in those house seats, and the fact that they're already organized in places where I would say dishonored legislators, congressmen are leaving. I think that there is sort of this breath of fresh air that comes with the package of being this woman that's actually working there. So blue, I'm not so sure it's a blue wave, maybe a little frilly, but the fact is, is that it's not the same as, uh, it's not just Democrats that are doing this. This is going to end up being because people are going to see someone who is, someone who looks like, acts like, and is espousing a better way that's not necessarily the old boys, I think. I think that it will be gender politics in the House. I'm not sure we have enough, but the Senate, I'm going there. I think that's happening. Okay. Okay, let's, uh, let's have some questions. Uh, I would just ask that your question, put your question in the form of a question. <laughs> regards to the um, idea of whether or not uh, we can get our gun laws changed, isn't there the possibility that we'll have a social change? And the social change being the fact like today we heard that Dick's Sporting Goods is mm -hmm. now refusing to sell uh, uh, the AR-15 type weapons. Uh, and I just uh, got on my phone that uh, Walmart is also uh, discontinuing those weapons. Mm -hmm. And when you uh, and when you see that happening, uh, I, I'm forced to look at why is it happening. And I'm looking at those young students uh, from uh, Parkland uh, who have been such a, a voice. And the very issues that they're talking about is exactly what Dick Sporting Goods is stopping, and, and that being. Uh, the, uh, they're changing the age also up to 21, even though it may not be a, a legal uh, change. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I tend to think that what's happening here, it's when anything becomes critical mass, nothing in this, it, it's the whole idea, if we have a few people saying, me too, and it becomes more of a disparate group of people throughout the country, the same thing is very true when it comes to gun laws or anything else. It's a matter of how long does it stay at the top of your mind? How long is it something that people are talking about? If we have some staying power with an issue like this, and these kids are indeed leading it, they're very compelling. I have to tell you, they are. I was thinking of how many of them I could, I could elect, actually. <laughs> so it's like, it all, and they're not even out of school yet. The fact is, is that I do believe that it's the critical mass of different kinds of background people that also is, um, I would say, in front of us for a long enough time so that we have to do something. Yeah, I think on the social change side, I mean, businesses respond to market forces more than anything yeah, else. That's true. And if they look at it and go, we're gonna get more negative publicity for selling the weapons than we are the revenue we're gonna get true. from true. trying to compete with Cabela's, because I don't think Cabela's is on the list of not selling the guns. <laughs> um, but, you know, it, the, the reality is, is they're going to re respond to market forces. The flip side of that is Delta announced that they were ending an affinity program. They had yeah. NRA members yeah. got a better seat or $10 off or something like that for if they said they're an NRA member when they were booking it. Yeah. Delta said, we are ending this affinity program. Lieutenant Governor of Georgia says, we're ending the $50 million tax break that we were going to offer you because you're ending the affinity program. So you're gonna get flip, you're gonna get pressure from both sides on, on that because in large parts of the country that aren't Bellingham, that aren't Washington State or 
Western Washington. The NRA is not a pejorative. And it's not the money they give. It's not, you know, people think that, oh, the, 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 the elected officials are just responding to the money they get from the NRA. It's the bumper stickers that you will still see on cars out there that say sportsman for Gorton or sportsman for McKenna that the NRA puts out. It's the people they put into campaigns that doorbell, that's the, that go door to door, that make phone calls, and yes, send emails to their friends, since we're talking about digital that they say, I'm speaking up for this person. And so you're going to see the pressure on both sides, but you're absolutely right that it will be the social pressure. Mm -hmm. I mean, let's face it, 50 years ago, there would have been ash, well, 20 years ago, there would have been ashtrays on the table. And if you were smoking a cigarette in here, that's fine. Now, you try to do that, <laughs> and you get beaten. <laughs> you know, so, and, but that's a social change. You know, yes, there are laws that raise the age to buy the cigarettes and so forth. But at the end of the day, it's just like, no, that's not okay. I don't want to smell your smoke. I mean, remember, airplanes, it used to be, yeah, there was a no smoking section. So what? The, the air is just going back and forth like this. I don't think we're there yet. But, you know, on, on the gun question, I think you are going to see some of those societal changes. But in other parts of the country, you're not going to see them because their values are such that they would rather have armed teachers than more restrictions on owning those arms. Yep. Yep. So let's bring it back to local. Over the last year, we've seen a lot of special elections uh, in other states mainly where they've gone from 20% uh, Trump advantage the previous year and then the Democrat wins. Mm -hmm. And I've looked at some of those races particularly in Oklahoma, there have been a lot of them, and I'm wondering if you've analyzed them. It seemed, I'm wondering how they translate to the, the lay of the land in legislative races here, particularly up here, <laughs> because we have conservative districts and liberal ones, and they just don't seem to match, but I think they're, we're, we're getting this excitement that that could happen, and I don't know whether it will. Well, that's less exciting for me, but uh, <laughs> no, I mean, you saw it. Washington State last year, I live, I live in the 45th district. That was a district that was represented by Senator Andy Hill, uh, uh, who passed away uh, in uh, November of 16. And so they held the special election 17 that changed control of the Senate. It was the most... Uh, watched and costly a state legislative race in the country last year. And despite all the advances in digital technology, I received 87 pieces of mail related to that race. Now, those of you who live in Senator Erickson's district four years ago, you were three, yeah, four years ago, 14, you probably could get close to that number yeah. of pieces of mail. Uh, in, in that district, and you'll see that again this year. Um, I, I think that you're seeing the typical swing that you have when a president gets elected and, uh, you know, the out party gets angry and they start winning back some of the races. And in the midterm, the so-called midterm election, the first even year election after a president gets elected, he loses. I mean, you know, it, it's just, it, it's statistically uh, George W. Bush in 02 for reasons that had a lot more to do with 9-11 yeah. You know, one, uh, you know, he didn't have those types of losses. But every other president uh, in, in, in modern era has lost in the, in the first midterms, and sometimes quite badly. Obama lost uh, badly in both of his midterms. Um, so you're going to see uh, Democrats make gains all across the country. Um, they don't have that many gains more to make in Washington State. Oh, I um, think on legislative we races. We do have quite a few, as a matter of fact, you know. But... <laughs> Up here, for example. Well, it, good, good luck with that. Uh, but I, I think you'll see, just predicting, I think on the state legislative side, you'll actually see Republicans uh, have a shot at taking back the state house because they need to take one seat to tie, two to take majority. And some of those districts uh, where there are races, uh, they've got a pretty good shot at taking it. On the Senate side, it's a little, you know, Republicans are playing defense in five seats and, yep. and Democrats are playing defense in one. And those are not good odds uh, for the Republicans. <laughs> you know, I don't believe that running on what an idiot 
Trump is, is going to be helpful to changing the DNR dynamics anywhere, much less here. I think that what you can do is you can use those as funny stories and reasons to you know, get up and troll the refrigerator at night. But the fact is, is that when it comes right down to how people vote, you're a good indication of the fact that people are, they're not stupid. They're not nearly as stupid as we used to get paid to tell you you were. The fact <laughs> is, is that when we see the real world right now, uh, people are making up their own minds based upon the kinds of things they see, pro or con, regarding what happened in Florida. These are the kind of things that are going to matter emotionally as opposed to what used to be the hit pieces we would do. What I do believe is that uh, when they talk about Blue Wave, Blue Wave is really taking that anger that people feel when they talk about something stupid one politician does. But when it comes to how it translates in terms of changing our House or changing the United States House of, uh, of Representatives, that's not, the, that's not the indication we see. What we see is that people in those backyards are taking a look at, well, you know, you know, I think we could use a change. The biggest thing I saw besides women voting for women is now we see people are not nearly as insistent upon voting for their incumbent. I hear people all the time tell me, I used to say, yeah, well, a pox on all their houses, except mine, except ours. Ours is a good guy. He, he actually continues to do good work. That's not the case anymore. Last year, we only had, uh, we had actually 4% more incumbents bite the dust. But frankly, I'm starting to hear that now. And we're seeing this year already more uh, incumbents already have what I would call more vi viable challengers than they've had before. And so that is, that's making for the social change of which Randy spoke. Many have decided not to run because they know they will be beat and that's why they're not running those chickens. <laughs> I think we have time for one more question. I wanted to ask about um, cyber intrusion in our elections, both foreign, by foreign and domestic kind of activists that might, might create fake events that they ask people to go to. And then, do you think our Federal Election Commission and our Public Disclosure Commission, is their you know, enforcement up to the task of policing actions like that? Who the hell knows? I have to say that I don't personally believe that our elections are hackable. I don't believe they're hackable. Do I believe that the marketing and the messaging is hackable and can get information in front of me to be part of that noise that helps me allegedly decide who to vote for? Yes. I do believe that the Russians did come and put a whole bunch of stuff in front of me, but so did Randy and a bunch of Republicans. They put a whole bunch of lies in front of me too, you know? <laughs> Not the same. The fact is, is that you have to be, at some point, you have to be smart enough to Putin, figure Putin this out. Putin had a bigger budget though. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, the excellent question. You are seeing across the country a reversion to paper ballots. Yes. Like we have. Because you want a paper trail on your ballot. So you're, you're seeing that. Uh, no, the Public Disclosure Commission uh, no, at the federal. state level and the Federal Election Commission at the national level have no ability whatsoever to have an impact on that because it's not their job. Mm -hmm. At your next meeting, the person whose job it is is Kim Wyman's. Yep. But as long as the legislature strangles funding for the Public Disclosure Commission, which they've done. And the Secretary of State's office, you will see them have a harder time of fighting back against that type of intrusion. I will say this. Um, you know, the Russian uh, involvement in the 2016 election was very consistent with what the Russians Terrible. have done since, yeah. since the end of World War II. They seek to destabilize the democracies of the West. I mean, I'm an old poli sci major, and I actually studied a lot of Russian politics back in the early 80s when, when, when we cared. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, and you had a president who said they were part of the evil empire. Yes, right. Uh, you know, it, it, and the Russians then just didn't have the internet to deliver their messages directly into Quickly, the homes yeah. and uh, desktops of American voters. They had to spend more money on it, and they had to do propaganda through other ways. Now propaganda is cheap. And they have taken advantage of that in a way that our federal government has been unwilling under President Obama to take on and under President Trump have ignored. And so they're going to continue to do it. Why? Because they don't want the West, particularly the United States, to have any credibility when they say Russia don't hold fake elections. 
Putin, you know, while he probably would prefer Trump to Clinton, he's playing a long game here. Mm -hmm. He just wants the West to look foolish with so their elections would. so that when the West then says, well, look at what the Russians did in Ukraine or look at what they, he goes, really, you want that chaos? Who are they to say this about me? Mm -hmm. And so that's what that effort was. And I, you know, I'm, I'm still reminded, and enough people aren't reminded about this, but in 2012, in a presidential debate, it was Mitt Romney who identified Russia as the biggest threat that we faced internationally. And Barack Obama mocked him for it. Mm -hmm. Oh, Russia. Again. Right. And he was right. But so was China, and so yeah. was well, Japan. You can only have, you can only have one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that the hacking is an equal opportunity sport <laughs> and happens to uh, anyone. And actually, the people that are doing most of the hacking, I am told by hackers, are the ones that literally are doing it just to see if they can do it and not necessarily do it because they're getting great amounts of money to be able to actually spend on their grandkids. I mean, first of all, none of them are gran have grandkids because they're only 22 years old. <laughs> Well, I think this very lively discussion today has reminded us of, of one thing, the actual importance of voting. Mm -hmm. It's the only way we're going to make any difference in things. Appreciate it. Love it. Thank you. Very good. Mm -hmm. Thank you.